Two weeks till Election Day and live debate coverage continues here on C-SPAN with three-term Democratic Congressman Sean Maloney facing his Republican opponent James O'Donnell for New York's 18th Congressional District. Live coverage now on C-SPAN, your primary source for campaign 2018. Welcome to this Fios One News special. It's a live debate in the race for Congress in New York's 18th Congressional District. I'm Richard French, and joining us here in our studios are the candidates, incumbent Democrat Sean Patrick Maloney and Republican challenger James O'Donnell. The rules for the debate, they've been agreed to by both campaigns. Candidates will have 90 seconds each for opening and closing statements, and we will alternate questions with candidates getting 90 seconds for their initial answers and 90 seconds for the responses. I may allow candidates 30 second rebuttals, or I may choose to ask follow questions, those at my discretion. So with that, let's begin. We had a coin flip, and per that, Mr. O'Donnell, you have the first opening statement. Thank you, and I'd like to thank Richard for uh, having this debate. Uh, thank the Congressman, looking forward to a, a one hour. Uh, so I'll begin with where I started my life. Uh, less than 20 miles from here, I grew up in the Bronx with this gorgeous Bronx accent. So when I get to D.C., no one will have a problem knowing where I'm from. Uh, a native New Yorker, spent my entire life here in New York. Uh, the last 43 years, I've actually lived and raised my family in our congressional district. Uh, eight kids, seven grandchildren, married to my lovely wife, Margaret, for 45 years, high school sweethearts. She is a special ed school teacher in the Goshen School District. So I know the Hudson Valley. I've been here, like I said, my entire life. I don't have to think about anything when there's problems in the Hudson Valley. I automatically know what to do and how to get the problem solved. My career started with the state police in 1974. I rose from trooper to lieutenant colonel. A great career with the state police. I then was uh, fortunate enough to be picked by Governor Pataki to lead the MTA police, police department the Metropolitan Transportation Authority Police Department. I was there during 9-11 and helped with the evacuation of New York City. I then went back to Orange County, where I was for eight years the deputy county executive. And now I serve in the county legislature the past two years. I'm looking forward to a fantastic debate this evening where the issues that are important to the Hudson Valley will be thoroughly discussed. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Well, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Richard. Thank you, RNN. Uh, thank you to my opponent. Uh, well, folks, my name is Sean Patrick Maloney. A few years ago, you sent me to Washington, and I have one rule in my office. We are going to get things done, regardless of political parties, regardless of politics, even though Washington is broken and dysfunctional. And I have a record now when I return to you and ask you for a renewal of my two-year contract. What is that record? It's one I'm very proud of. We've passed 31 bills into law. I bet you didn't know Congress did 31 things in the last few years, but we have. What do those bills do? They help our veterans, they help our farmers, they build infrastructure, they fight the opioid epidemic. And I'm looking forward to discussing those measures with you tonight. We've also helped 6,000 of you one at a time, helping our neighbors. That's my job. When you walk in my office and you ask for help, we've helped secure $18 million for those of you who sought help from my office for a problem with Social Security or Medicare or for veterans, 1,700 veterans and military families. We've helped secure $8 million that they were owed and weren't getting. I've held 111 town halls listening to you everywhere in the district from Pine Bush to Pound Ridge, from Poughkeepsie down to Tuxedo Park. And I've listened to you and I've heard you tell me that you are sick of the fighting and the bickering in Washington and you want us to focus on things. So what are that, that are important to you. So what are my goals uh, for another two years in Congress? Well, if you give me your voice and your vote and send me back to Washington, I'll keep working across the aisle. I have one of the most bipartisan records in the Congress. And I will keep working to make our train safer as I have, to get your water clean, to protect the Hudson River, to fight the opioid epidemic, to protect Social Security and Medicare, to make sure your taxes stay low, but we invest in our country and our students, in our schools, and we keep them safe from shootings and we keep our country safe from threats at home and abroad. It's been the honor of my life to serve you in Congress, 
And I'm asking for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. And with that, let us begin. Um, and the first question, it's for both of you, but I'll start with you, Mr. O'Donnell. And if you will, it's the elephant in the room, President Trump. Last week, he said to prospective voters, when you go into the voting booth, think of me. His point, while he may not be on the ballot, is without a doubt, his two-year record will be. So from your perspective and to the electorate, do you believe President Trump has been good for America, has been good for New York, has been good for the 18th District? Sure. So to be on point here, I'm running to represent the 18th Congressional District. I'm running as Jimmy O'Donnell to represent. Uh, the president uh, certainly wasn't good to the Congressional District with the tax plan. All right, the salt tax of $10,000 was not high enough. But I blame the Democrats for that. They boycotted the meeting, all right? You can't boycott meetings, uh, Pelosi and Schumer, and expect to get a good tax plan. You can't fight for New Yorkers if you boycott meetings, all right? If they were at the meeting, possibly the assault uh, tax could have went up to uh, $25,000. But I will not boycott any meetings if sent to Washington, D.C. Just to be clear, when the president says to the voters in the 18th, hey, when you go into the booth, think of me. Pull the lever if you want to vote Republican, but think of me. Do you want your supporters to think of Trump when they're deciding between yourself or the congressman? I want them to think about the progress we've made economically. I want them to think about the companies that have come back here and brought back billions of dollars in uh, money that was uh, sent overseas during the Obama administration and the 20,000 jobs coming back by different companies coming back to this country. That's what I want them to think about. I want them to think about the tax plan and the tax break. I want them to think about, do you really want uh, Congresswoman Pelosi to be Speaker of the House again? Uh, my opponent voted for her in uh, 2012 and I'm sure he's going to vote for her again if they take over the House. Well, let's give your an opponent uh, a chance to respond specifically. How has the president been for the 18th district in New York writ large? Well, look, it is my responsibility to work with the president. I don't want the president to fail, but I do want him to work uh, for all of you and for the people I represent. So when he's right, I agree with him. I worked with the president to pass the most important uh, anti-addiction legislation to help us in our fight against the opioid epidemic, uh, the CARA Act. Uh, so that we can finally get on top of that epidemic. I worked uh, with the president to do things like, um, you know, stop these terrible trade deals. I agree with much of what the president has done to set a new course in renegotiating NAFTA. But when the president is wrong, uh, I've stood up to the president, and I'm not afraid to do that. And Mr. O'Donnell just said he has some problems with the tax bill, but of course, Mr. O'Donnell supports the tax bill. What I've heard from all of you is that you don't like the fact that you got your state and local property deduction whacked by this crowd in Washington. That's not good for the district. When I, when I, when I mean stand up to the president, I'm talking about things like the Gateway Tunnel, which is the most important infrastructure project for New York and the country. The president's trying to kill it. I'm going to fight him on that. And I'm sure as heck going to stand up to him when I think he says something that's racist or something that's inappropriate or he's coming after vulnerable communities or, or, we're, or we're ripping families away, uh, babies away from their mothers at the border. You bet I'm going to stand up to the president. But I will work with him where I can. I have one of the most bipartisan records in Congress. And it's my job to do things like get the Coast Guard to stop that terrible plan to put Anchorage, uh, oil anchorages, barges on the Hudson River. I killed that plan working with this administration. So there's things I like and things I don't. But in the main, the point is, is that I'm working for you. And if you give me another chance to go back to Washington, that's what I'm going to keep doing. The next issue I want to get into is immigration. Both you guys, I believe, are of Irish descent. You don't have to go back that far in American history to remember the signs of Irish need not apply. How do we navigate this? And, and I'll give you a chance to first respond, Congressman, to you mentioned family separations. We've heard Mexicans call rapists and murderers, uh, people from the African continent, from the S-hole countries. I can go on. But I'm also not sure that the Americans would welcome with open arms that caravan making its way to the border. Where do you draw the line between what is of national security and opportunity and, and how do you navigate that, um, especially in this political climate that we're in? 
Right, well look, it is very important that we enforce our laws. It's also important that we enforce our principles. Uh, you know, Jimmy and I aren't just both Irish, uh, we're both Catholic, and I agree with the Catholic Church on this. I think that we can find a way to be both compassionate and to hold people who break our laws accountable. Look, we need to secure our border, no problem for me, and I've voted that way. We need to do it in the smart way. We don't want a 16th century solution for a 21st century problem. That's why this wall is a dumb idea. But we should have better electronic fencing. We should have more border uh, patrol agents. We can absolutely have drones and electronic surveillance increased. We should focus on the ports of entry, where 90% of all people and goods come in and out of the country. That's going to help us in the drug war and other things. There's smart ways to secure the border, and I support it. But my goodness, we don't need to rip babies out of the arms of moms at the border. We don't need to ignore the needs of our farmers right here in the Hudson Valley who are beat up by this immigration system. They can't get the workers they need. They want the H, uh, H-2A program reformed. I've been working on that. We can help ourselves if we fix the problem. And these problems in the immigration system are the result of Congress not getting the job done under the Republican leadership. You give the Democrats a chance, we are going to compromise and get this done with real enforcement at the border, but a policy that is in keeping with our best traditions that allowed families like mine and Jimmy's to come here and thrive on the strength of our values and our merits, and we can do both. And that is our history as, as Americans, and we should, we should remember that. The same question to you, Mr. O'Donnell, and, and help voters get a clear line. Family separation certainly have been a point. Presidents talked about merit-based immigration. Um, and then there's also been conversations where even people who've served in our military who aren't of American citizenship yet have traditionally always been given citizenship, now won't. Where do you draw the lines between that's the administration's policy, but that's not mine? Should taxpayers pay for the wall? Give, give an idea to the voter out there where you believe the policy of this country should be. The policy of this country should not have been kicked down the road. I would have stayed in D.C. and not had a summer recess. So they recessed. They kicked it down the road to get it past the election. That's a disgrace. You cannot use human beings as pawns in a political process. So I volunteer. I'm the vice chair of the Newburgh Army Unity Center. I see 400 kids every Saturday morning shaking hands with my friend, Mr. Kaplan. Those kids, probably 90% of them are citizens, probably 10% of them are not. Probably 90% of their parents are part of the 11 or 12 million people here illegally. All right? I have a plan for immigration, and it includes a wall. A wall is not a curse word. You know, you can call it a barrier, you can call it whatever you want, but it secures the border. It worked in Israel, it'll work here. But as the congressman said, you need uh, better... Uh, uh, technology. You need the uh, fencing, the mountains, the rivers, but you need the drones. You need to hire a lot more border security people. The caravan that's coming? No, you have to stand up for America. All right? They shouldn't be coming. You let this caravan in, the next caravan will be 15,000, and the one after that will be 30,000. So you need a pathway to citizenship. Uh, I have a plan for a 10-year pathway to citizenship for the families I see every Saturday morning in Newburgh, all right? And if you're in the military, it's a five-year pathway to citizenship, all right? You register, whether you charge uh, $300 or $400, you put a number on it. Most of these families are working. So part of the uh, cost of registering everybody and getting everybody out of the shadows will be paid by them. And then they pay Social Security taxes. They get a Social Security card. They're able to get a driver's license. But if you think you're going to deport 11 or 12 or and 13 million people, that's not going to happen. They need a pathway to citizenship. The people I see every Saturday morning are good, decent human well, beings. Let me ask about those people. I'm sure some of the kids are what we call dreamers. Right. They were brought here as sometimes as infants or certainly as kids. The only language a lot of them know is English, let alone they've never set foot or remember in their host country. There's a debate about whether or not we deport, deport that population. Where do you stand? I just stated uh, we have to bring them out of the shadows, register them, give but them not a, send them back until no, they have it. Give they them stay a here. pathway yep. to citizenship, right, I'm, I'm, and if they uh, join the military, they can become citizens in five years rather than ten years, as long as they're not convicted of a crime. Convicted, not arrested. Convicted of a crime, so they become 
good human beings in our country, good citizens. I want to just get two points of clarification. One for you, Congressman. Um, there has been a lot of criticism that there's been an overreach by ICE. Some Democratic lawmakers believe the agency should be disbanded. What do you think? Right, well, I, I, what I have said is that the problem is the policy. The problem is when you have the Trump administration uh, engaged in a policy that they call zero tolerance, what that means is that they make no distinction between a violent uh, drug offender, a gang member, or a guy like Martin Martinez, who spent 30 years of his life living in Newburgh, working at the Office Depot Supply Warehouse in Middletown, uh, who had two kids in America, worked two jobs, he and his wife, and was summarily deported after he had been voluntarily reporting himself for more than a decade. And he was so depressed and heartbroken by this, he died of a heart attack shortly after he returned to Mexico. We destroyed that family because of that policy. So I understand when people see kids ripped away from their mom's arms at the border, when I hear the words come out of the president's mouth. By the way, Mr. O'Donnell talked about the Dreamer program, but it is of course the, the Trump administration that on its own decided to throw the Dreamers out. We had actually, in fact, you know, developed a plan to have them come out of the shadows. Hundreds of thousands of them did. Tens of thousands right in this district we rep represent, uh, that I represent here in the Hudson Valley. And the fact of the matter is, is we have now thrown their lives into chaos because the president has decided to deport them. And we have delayed that through court order and other actions. But that's not a policy. That's not a fix. That's not going to help the Martinez family. That's not going to fix the problem. A comprehensive solution where both sides compromise, where we have more enforcement, sure, but we also have a path to citizenship, where we take care of the dreamers, where we allow our veterans to earn citizenship uh, because of their service, where we especially help our farmers and high-tech industries create the jobs and grow the economy through that immigrant uh, workforce that they depend on. We can do all these things if we stop fighting and start working together. And that's what I'm going to do if you send me back to Washington. I have one foreign policy question, and I want a lot more questions related to the district and nationally. Um, and I'll start with you, Mr. O'Donnell. Saudi Arabia. Um, the administration today condemned what they call the cover-up, but a lot of people have been looking for more clarity as the condemnation for the crime. You used to be the former chief of police with the MTA on 9-11, so nobody's got to remind you what it was like that day. And also no one has to remind you that 16 of the 19 hijackers came from Saudi Arabia and were funded uh, by some of these uh, royal family dollars. To that end, will you believe, I assume, that there's a clean line between accountability? Does this go straight to the royal family? Or if it turns out that there's a few side actors that are condemned, but the royal family in effect gets a pass and we do military deals with them and the rest, that's part of doing business. Where's your line for where the buck should stop? Well, the buck starts, stops with the royal family. Obviously, they control the country, they run the country. So we see, have to see how the investigation evolves. Uh, obviously, we're not very happy with what we've seen so far. Uh, first, they said he uh, wasn't there. Then the videotape uh, tells us uh, uh, differently. But the investigation uh, should come out and tell us exactly what happened. But if 15 people were sent there as a hit squad, hey, my life has been sent, uh, spent in public safety. I can tell you, uh, I, I believe what people tell me until I don't believe it. And I, in this case, I think we're going to find out that a lot of what they said initially is wrong. Uh, we don't even know where uh, uh, the body is. We do know he's deceased, but we don't know too much about the investigation. What they've told us so far is totally inadequate. So if there has to be sanctions, then sanctions will uh, be forthcoming. But Saudi Arabia, they took one step forward with uh, allowing women to drive, and now they've taken six steps backwards with this assassination. Congressman, I know and I've heard you've condemned not only the actions um, uh, that have happened to Mr. Khashoggi, but we know the atrocities at the hands of the Saudis in Yemen and elsewhere. But they are a strategic ally in the Middle East, or whether we want to acknowledge it or not. Is America safer with a sideline Saudi Arabia, or do we need to hold our nose and still use them for intelligence and everything else? Well, it's a false choice, and, and we, we must not fall into the trap of thinking that we either throw out the window all of our principles and our senses of right and wrong, uh, or 
you know, we, 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 we desert an ally. The fact of the matter is, is that we are strong when we are good. I was in the region recently. I spent Christmas uh, in Baghdad and uh, traveled during the same trip to the Emirates. Uh, got a full classified briefing on the situation in Saudi Arabia and what they're doing in Yemen. I uh, went on to Afghanistan. I understand the, the risks in that region. I understand the importance of U.S. allies in that region, and I take that very seriously. But like many of you, I was disgusted by, uh, by what I learned about uh, the killing of this journalist. This is a Washington Post reporter who lives in the United States, who's a permanent resident here. And if we don't stand up for something uh, on, on a case like this, then what do we stand for as a country? And the President of the United States should be a moral voice in the world. And it is not weak to say that it is wrong to kill innocent people, to murder them in a diplomatic consulate, in a NATO country, um, and to do so in a violent and medieval way, dismembering the body. Um, and lying about it every step of the way. It's an outrage. We should ground the relationship until we understand the truth. Everything should be suspended, from arms sales to everything else, and we should get to the bottom of it. And if this crown prince is personally accountable, then he needs to be held accountable. This is a critical ally, and we cannot desert that uh, relationship. But it does not mean that we need to look the other way when there's been a murder. Uh, and this is, this is exactly the type of moral equivocation that we have seen too much of from this administration. We should be strong and good at the same time. Let me uh, move a little closer to home and we'll start with a question that's been central to the campaign. And this is for you, Congressman. Much has been made of the fact that you ran for both Attorney General and Congress simultaneously. And only after you lost the primary for Attorney General did you focus on keeping your congressional job. Why shouldn't the voters of the 18th District feel that they're basically second place? Well, it's a fair question, and I have absolutely um, you know, heard those concerns. Uh, what I can tell you is that there's only one reason I ever ran for public office, and it is to do good things and to serve all of you. That's how I've passed 31 bills into law. That's what we were doing when we helped 6,000 of you one at a time uh, and helped you secure $18 million that you had coming to you that weren't getting. 1,700 veterans and military families. And you don't pass 31 bills into law if your heart isn't in it, particularly in the Congress that I'm dealing with down in Washington. Those are bipartisan bills that make your trains safer, that help our farmers, that fight the opioid epidemic, that work, work on our infrastructure, that fight Lyme disease, that do good things for you. We helped clean up the Superfund site in Hopewell Junction. $12 million of federal funds at work right now, clean water for that community. These are the real results that I've delivered in Congress. And I've done it because I love this work and it's been the honor of my life to do it. And, and all I've ever wanted to do is to do as much as I can uh, with the time that you've given me. I'm proud of the record that I've built uh, and I'm asking for your vote on November 6th so I can keep doing it. And if I've done this much in a divided Congress as a relatively junior member of Congress, well think of how much more I can do, particularly if we're in the majority and I have some seniority. I'm gonna keep focused on the issues that are important to you. And that's, uh, and that's my case for, for, for November 6th. Mr. Grant, I want to give you a chance to respond, but also explain why you, you think... Yeah, I want I'm to a little confused. What was the question for that answer? Well, I'll let you uh, try and parse it, but my <coughs> question as you answer is, speak to this as an issue in the campaign, but also, why is ambition wrong for your opponent if you're also seeking higher office at the same time? So it's a matter of spending $5.3 million. This is the second time he's run for attorney general. $5.3 million for any race is outrageous. Uh, there's an FEC complaint then against him on that, uh, mixing some of the campaign funds. I'll let the FEC handle that. But I think a lot of the uh, people in the 18th congressional district are uh, disappointed that uh, he deserted them. He missed five votes down in Congress while he's out in Long Island or up in Buffalo. Uh, running for attorney general. Uh, if I spent $5.3 million on a race, I certainly hope I come in better than third place with only 25% of the vote. But he, he never answered the question. All right, he talked about some of his accomplishments down in uh, Congress, which were done in a bipartisan uh, manner. Uh, if he gets back to Congress, all right. I sure hope he continues to work in a bipartisan manner. But whether he's able to stay away from the Pelosi agenda, that remains to be seen. If she takes over to Congress again, we are in big trouble. The tax plan will go out the window. We'll have open borders. Uh, he'll, he might be in the majority if it swings that way November 6th. But he won't be able to vote his conscience. He'll be able to vote with Pelosi. 
If I can, if I can say a word about that. Um, look, folks, uh, you know, for six years, uh, I've conducted myself with honor and integrity uh, in the office that you have entrusted me to. There's only one candidate in this stage who has accepted illegal corporate contributions in this campaign and been called to the uh, called on it by the Federal Election Commission not once but twice, and he's sitting right over there. And if we're going to question people's public service, then then let's talk about uh, Jimmy O'Donnell's record as a county legislature, where his signature achievement prior to that was trying to shut down Valley View, the nursing home in Orange County, which would have left 50 veterans and hundreds of seniors with nowhere to go. That was his contribution in public service. And the fact of the matter is, folks, is that is that we can do better than this kind of back and forth. What I'm telling you is that I have a record in Congress. I have a 97% attendance record uh, on my votes. I've passed 31 bills into law, that's not easy. And you don't do it if your heart's not in it. And we've helped thousands of you who've come to, you, uh, come to us with your problems. We killed the Anchorage's proposal on the Hudson River. We've got clean water in Newburgh. We've helped cops and firefighters in Poughkeepsie and Middletown and Newburgh. Uh, we're getting the job done and that's because my heart's in it. And if you give me another two years in office, that's just what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and get a lecture on public service uh, from someone who has a real checkered record of his own. I'll give you 20 seconds to respond. My record stands for itself. As far as Valley View, there was three options there: close it, sell it, or fund it. The legislature funded it, right? I was the one that told them those three options, so it got funded. Right. So to try to threaten seniors and veterans that it was going to be closed is a disgrace. I'm there once a month speaking to the seniors there. I'll be there next Tuesday speaking to the seniors. As you can attack my record anytime you want. You, you put my record of public service against your record of being in this district a little over five years to me being here 43 years, I'll stand by my record. I want to I wanna move uh, to a subject of tone, and this is certainly not restricted to the 18th district. Um, we've seen this really for the last two plus years. Um, but there was an incident on the campaign trail uh, that I'd like to get your, both your thoughts on. Mr. Donald, you criticized your opponent for his, quote, R-rated attack against um, some of the president's actions and also the supporters of the president who echoed them. I know we've got a coarseness in today's politics, but his anger was directed at policies that would directly impact his family. So I want to give you a couple hypotheticals and to show the electorate how you would react under something similar. Again, this is all a hypothetical. How would you relate if you had a gay kid and the government wanted to make him less equal than the law now allows? Or if a grandchild was transgender and like we saw just two days ago, the administration wanted to rewrite laws that that child couldn't identify themselves the way they saw themselves. Would you drop an F-bomb too in that or not? No, I, I wouldn't drop an F-bomb, but let me just say my entire career from trooper right up the ranks, I, I defended everyone. I didn't go knock on a door to answer a complaint and say, listen, are you, you Republican, Democrat, conservative, independent? Uh, do you believe in X or do you believe in Y? I defended everybody and I'll continue to defend everybody down in D.C. Uh, I won't go down there and have a 14% uh, approval rating as part of that group. I will increase that approval rating. But when it comes to discrimination, no, I, I will definitely not ever, ever put up with that. I work side by side with every gender, every uh, race, and I'll continue to do that. Uh, so to be clear, early this week, as people I think know, the administration is talking about changing a policy that if a child sees themselves as a different gender than what they were born as, they want to rewrite the regulations that it doesn't matter how they see themselves, it's how the birth certificate says. Do you call that discrimination? Well, it's something I would vote on, all right? I'm not going to support that. I'm not going to support the president 100% on some of his policies. I didn't support the separation of babies. Whoever came up with that idea should have been fired. Whoever came up with the idea to continue uh, military exercises uh, a week before uh, he was meeting with North Korea should have been fired. Uh, He's uh, gotten some bad advice from some people, and uh, he should correct those. But when it comes to discrimination, 
I am 100% going to be on the forefront fighting against that. I've done it my entire life as a trooper. I did it down at the MTA Police Department. I've done it as a legislator. I've done it as the deputy county exec. I, am, I have five daughters, five sisters I grew up with, two brothers. My parents had the same family as me, three boys, five girls. Hey, I've taught them all. Mm -hmm. You don't discriminate against anyone. You brought it up in the beginning yep. uh, uh, about that we both come from Irish Catholic families, all right, that the uh, Irish need not apply. So I've seen that. I grew up in a, a neighborhood half Jewish, half Catholic, okay? I've played ball, mm. worked together. Uh, I brought my youngest son over to Newburgh to uh, play yep. basketball and, and learn what it is to uh, grow up in an inner city. Well, let me ask you, and again, the incident, at least from the rec recording of it, I can't really get into the language, but you're pretty strong where you said not only where he can go, but anyone who supports these things can go too. You've been critical of the coarseness that's become Washington. Do you regret any of the language? And what do you say to people who say that was another way of saying deplorables? Look, you know, yes, I did use some strong language. We were talking about people who were coming after my family and vulnerable people. And uh, I think one of the reasons people like me is I don't talk like some stupid politician. I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel. And I told you, I've worked with this president on issues from our trade policies to fighting the opioid epidemic. I'm dying to work with him on a good infrastructure bill for the Hudson Valley. I'll work with him where he's right. But I'll tell you what. What we were talking about there were those guys with torches shouting Jews will not replace us marching in Charlottesville. We're talking about whether the president can say young Nazis have no place in our discourse or whether he's going to equivocate about that and whether those people are a threat to, to, to families that are vulnerable and they are. And I am not going to mince words about that. And it's, it's all well and good for, uh, for Mr. O'Donnell to talk about being against discrimination. But of course, we have no idea where he stands on issues like marriage equality. We have no idea where he stands on issues like a woman's right to control the reproductive freedom. Uh, talk is cheap, but down in Washington, it is the Republicans who are coming after uh, LGBT families hammer and tong. This administration is throwing transgender people out of the military, or trying to. It's trying to prevent uh, same-sex parents from adopting. That's being voted on in Congress. What's Mr. O'Donnell going to do about that? The fact of the matter is, is this administration, in its language and in its policies, has been intolerant and, and discriminatory. And I'm not going to mince words about it, but I will work with this president because that's my job. But you're gonna, I'm going to also tell it like it is, and I'm going to stick up for vulnerable people. I want to get to the next issue, uh, and I'll start with you, Congressman. The subject's guns. Uh, tell the voters at home, whether you support it or not, um, the SAFE Act in New York, whether or not you support an assault weapons ban. And you said you reached across the aisle on this issue in Congress. Specifically, what have you accomplished on the subject of guns in this country? Right, it's such an important issue. Uh, the fact is, is that I met with the kids from Parkland just, uh, just days after that shooting in Florida. And we did pass some legislation that is right now sending uh, resources to communities like Goshen, where where Mr. O'Donnell is from to help with school security. That's something, but it's not nearly enough. We need to ban assault weapons. Uh, we need to make sure we have real background checks. We need to stop uh, people who are on the no-fly list from walking in and buying uh, any weapon they choose. That's called no-fly, no-buy. We never got around to banning bump stocks, even after that terrible shooting uh, that we saw in Las Vegas. The fact of the matter is, is we are seeing an increase in the lethality and the frequency of these shootings, and we are not powerless. We are right down the road here from Newtown, Connecticut, where so many young uh, children lost their lives. And the Republicans in Washington have done nothing on this because they are in the back pocket of the NRA because of money. And it's disgusting. We don't have to get anywhere near the Second Amendment, which I respect, to do some common sense things that will make our schools safer. We have to act and we all have to work together to do that. That's why I held four town halls around the district to get your ideas. I'm very proud that we had young people at one of them uh, who were so articulate and passionate on this issue. We need to listen to them. We need to act as a community together, uh, not affecting hunt hunters or sportsmen who are not the problem, not going after law-abiding gun owners. Uh, they're not the problem. But what is the problem is the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, these highly lethal um, uh, assault weapons that are too easy to access and that are creating an extraordinary death toll. And I believe we can do a lot better. Same question to you, and as a person who's spent his life in public safety, as you said, 
Are more guns the answer? Should we ban AR-15s? Give us an idea of where you stand on the subject of guns. So this morning at 8 o'clock, I was at Port Jervis High School that just this year put the uh, SRO uh, officer to protect the students there. Uh, school safety, I was fortunate enough to go down to the White House a few months ago uh, when the president uh, had a uh, forum on uh, school safety. I'm a big proponent, like I stated earlier, my wife is a uh, special ed school teacher in the Goshen School District. So there's a number of things that have to be done with school safety. Number one, you need uh, an armed police officer in every building. Number two, you need magnetometers. Number three, you need uh, bulletproof glass on a, a first floor. Number four, you need more cameras into the uh, buildings. You have to have them hooked up. I introduced uh, legislation last year to uh, appropriate $250,000 to give all our school districts in Orange County the ability to uh, hook their cameras into the 911 uh, center. Uh, one of the things we do over at the Newburgh Armory is shake every child's hand that comes into the building uh, every Saturday morning. We need meters and greeters because we have to handle the mental health aspect of this crisis, and it is a crisis, and you can't do just some of those things. Some of the school districts now are doing the uh, armed police officers, but they're not doing everything. To solve this problem, you have to do everything. You can't wait for the next incident to say, okay, now we'll do magnetometers. Washington do says they can't now. find the money. Where do you find the money to pay for all this? School tax bills are high enough, but I, I give this example when I'm out campaigning. So we just built a new uh, government center in Orange County. All right, so when you're going to get your eyes tested at DMV, you go through a single point of entry right, which is part of the school safety program I proposed. Single point of entry, you have your pocketbook or your wallets emptied, goes through a magnetometer, you go through the magnetometer. There's an armed security guard, there's also an armed deputy sheriff, and you're going into the building, you go past that security, you'll make a right, quick left, you're in DMV, you get your eyes tested by Mrs. Jones. Certainly Mrs. Jones deserves to be secure at her workplace. Why can't we do the same thing for Johnny in the first grade? And where do you get the money? Hey, unfortunately, you got to look at the school taxes, uh, get some federal funding. Uh, the congressman said he sent up some money to go send up more money. We send in New York $40 billion more in dollars down to Washington than we get back. I won't sit back and allow that discrepancy to continue. We need to get our fair share of what we send let to me, D.C. back. Let me stay on law enforcement though one question. The president has revisited the idea on a national basis of bringing in stop and frisk. Do you think that was a good policy in New York when it was on the books and do you think that should be the national rule of thumb when it comes to law enforcement, particularly in communities of color? I don't think it matters whether it's communities of color or anything. If there's a crime problem, you have to put boots on the ground to solve that problem. All right, the two things you need, all right, uh, for uh, crime prevention, it's visibility, visibility, visibility. For uh, solving crimes, it's tenacity, tenacity, tenacity. So visibility, hey, Newburgh's doing great. Uh, they... Uh, uh, amount of people being shot in Newburgh have, has gone down tremendously. And part of that is for the technology they put out there as far as visibility with cameras in the area and the ability when a, a shot goes off in the city of Newburgh, uh, the police know exactly where that shot was taken and they're able to respond to that area quickly. So stop and frisk is just part of it. Uh, I wouldn't uh, rule anything out when it comes to the safety of our neighborhoods. Public safety is number one. Look at what's happened in Chicago. Like it's a dip. Well, like if, if, if I could finish, it'd be nice. Anyway, Chicago has had a horrific problem with their citizens, and nothing's been done about it. 
Well, okay. it, it's interesting that Mr. O'Donnell ref references the shot spotter technology in Newburgh because that was done with help from my office. It's interesting he talks about the police in Newburgh because it's through my office that we've actually provided them the resources they need to do their difficult jobs. And the firefighters in Newburgh, well, they're on the job today because for six years my office has insisted that those federal grants get renewed. Talk to Terry Ehlers, the chief of uh, the fire department in Newburgh. You don't have to take my word for it. He'll tell you. And one of the first things I did when I got elected was move my office into one of the toughest neighborhoods in Newburgh to send a signal that that's where the need was. And so these are, the, these are exactly the accomplishments that I have achieved in the time you've given me in Congress. And we are making progress in Newburgh and in Poughkeepsie. There, the Republican mayor, Rob Rollison, well, he supports me. Why? Because I support his fire department, because I support his police, because I am there every day helping him across the aisle, politics on the side, getting things done. Same is true if you talk to Joe DiStefano, the mayor in Middletown, or go out to Port Jervis, where we've worked there to help that community fight the opioid epidemic. We are getting results by working across the aisle in areas of law enforcement and everything else. It's also noteworthy that Mr. O'Donnell didn't take a position on stop and frisk, which I think was a bad idea, and we've proved it in New York City that you can keep the crime rate going down without, without uh, harassing people of color. Want to move to another issue, obviously, in the 18th, and that's Indian Point. Congressman, did you support the shuttering of Indian Point, and what's going to happen to all the people in Buchanan and the surrounding areas that rely on that plant for work? Right. It's very important that we have a responsible plan to close Indian Point. I do support it. It's also the case that if you do it right, you can grow the economy, particularly in the short term, because there's a tremendous amount of work, good jobs, in the decommissioning of a nuclear power station like Indian Point. You also have a tremendous amount of energy infrastructure on that site that can be repurposed and reused. And there'll be an offsetting benefit to those communities because the increase in property values and in tourism that we see when we move away from a, a facility like a nuclear power station. The fact of the matter is, folks, the evacuation plans are a joke. Uh, my family lives uh, 10 miles up the river. So many of you live in the shadow of Indian Point. You know that if we were building that plant today, we would never put it in this densely populated uh, part of the Hudson Valley. And you can't get east-west in, in this part of the district on a good day, let alone in an emergency. So it's a good idea that it's closing. But I take very seriously the issue of keeping your energy prices low. That's why I've supported energy infrastructure, sometimes having to stand up to my own party to do it. That's why I think we have a, a lot of work to do in terms of transmission infrastructure to make sure we get more power to the area to keep prices low. And there's other things we can do. We can do a better job of incentivizing you to conserve. That's why I lead the fight in Congress on property assessed clean energy, an idea that came right out of Bedford here in Westchester County that would allow you to finance energy improvements in your own home, put it right on your property tax bill, give the work to local contractors, and get your energy costs lower because the best generation is conservation. And there's other things we can do. Uh, but, that's, but that's my position on Indian Point. I'm glad it's closing, but I want it done in a responsible way. Mr. O'Donnell. So crisis management is my expertise. So at the Deputy County Exec, we had annual uh, tabletops. We had annual uh, exercises on what would happen if there was a, a crisis at the Indian Point. And the Congressman is right. Uh, if something happened there, you're not. The, I used to tell people the only way you're getting away from uh, a crisis there, if uh, it starts a, a leak into the air, is by boat. Because the, the roads are going to be a, a joke. You won't be able to get anywhere. And I also told the county exec at the time, you can look around our great building. We built a, a brand new one, a 911 center for emergency management uh, in our crisis room. We have uh, room for 60 to 70 uh, different companies and uh, agencies that show up. I told them, if there's a crisis like this, look around. For the exercise, the, all these desks are filled. If there's a crisis, half these desks won't be filled. So you're going to need somebody who's been through crisis, who knows how to get things done in a crisis, and that's me. We have seen it probably um, too many dinner tables to count the debates during the Kavanaugh confirmation. Um, but it really depends on a person's perspective and life experience on how they looked at either how Mr. Kavanaugh was treated or how Dr. Ford was treated and how the Congress or more specifically the Senate acted. I know neither of you, whether elected or would have been elected, would have cast a vote. But nonetheless, I'll start with you, Mr. O'Donnell. Given what you heard of the testimony and some of the varying accounts of what happened many years ago and in the subsequent years, 
Should Brett Kavanaugh be a Supreme Court justice? And was he and Dr. Ford treated fairly in the process? So my uh, last year on the state police, I was a lieutenant colonel in charge of internal affairs. Uh, 4,000 uniformed troopers, a, thou a little less than that, 3,500, 1,000 BCI, and in charge of internal affairs meant if you got a personnel complaint, someone complained about a trooper, they would come in and you'd sit them down and they'd say, I, I don't really want to get involved in this, but this trooper should not be on the road, should not be a trooper. And we'd have to sit them down and tell them, no, you have a responsibility, a civic responsibility to come forward. We can't have one trooper uh, that ruins the reputation of 4,000 troopers. So look what happens now where uh, Dr. Ford makes an anonymous phone call on a hotline to the Washington Post. Do we know how uh, that stays anonymous? Then it gets a letter written to uh, the congresswoman in California who, through her staff, kicks it up to Senator Feinstein, okay? And her staff looks at it. At the point it gets to Senator Feinstein's office, that's the point the FBI has to become involved. They can't sit on that for six weeks. They did a tremendous service, disservice to Dr. Ford, a tremendous disservice to uh, now uh, Justice Kavanaugh, but more importantly, a tremendous disservice to the entire country. Because not many people speak about this, and this comes from my background of doing investigations, my background in uh, public safety. If the FBI had gotten that information right then and there when that letter hit Senator Feinstein's office, they would have had the ability to go interview Mark Judge Cold. Mark Judge would not have known that they were coming to interview him. The other people that were named that were at the party would not have known people were coming to interview them. They did a tremendous disservice to all of us. We will never know the truth. That's and as it. I stated earlier, yeah. hey, it's the truth till you prove it's not the truth. So you would have voted to confirm it? Yes. Okay. Same question. Um, how would you have voted if given an opportunity? I think they should have found somebody else. I think the president could have had another pick. Uh, I like the days when we had a 60 vote threshold in the Senate, so there had to be some bipartisanship. You know, we have every area of our life now being ripped apart in this red team, blue team political nonsense. Uh, I'm sick to death of it, I know you are. And I've conducted myself in a Congress that has been bipartisan and that is results oriented. But in this case, I found Dr. Ford uh, entirely credible and I do not think that anybody has a right to a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court. And I think those hearings were a circus and there's enough blame to go around, God knows, and both parties play politics with this stuff. But I do think it would have helped heal the country if we found somebody, uh, somebody else. Still would have been the president's pick and, uh, and they still would have had the votes in the Senate. But I think we could have done better. And if I can just say, I do think it is, um, it is noteworthy uh, that Mr. O'Donnell is going to talk about his uh, history in personnel matters at, at the state police because, of course, Mr. O'Donnell was sued by, by three state troopers when he was at the state police for failing to take seriously uh, complaints about misconduct. And that lawsuit was brought by them uh, with allegations that he overlooked uh, misconduct by state troopers and, in fact, was, was uh, involved in punishing people who were whistleblowers who were trying to bring it forth. So I think that's part of the record that I've been talking about of public service that is, uh, that is questionable in Mr. Donald's background. And I don't think, I don't think we should be uh, punishing whistleblowers. And I think that's what you saw uh, when Mr. O'Donnell had an opportunity to take these kind of allegations seriously. So why don't you ask the congressman the result of that uh, lawsuit? I'll give you an opportunity to respond yourself. Well, I think you know the answer is it was dismissed. All right, and uh, it got dismissed. I, I was actually uh, retired by the time it got dismissed. So it was actually dismissed right down the road here in White Plains where uh, I was uh, deposed. Uh, the superintendent was sued. Uh, the chief inspector was sued. And me as a lieutenant colonel was sued by uh, three disgruntled employees, one of whom came on the job with me, uh, one of whom I cleared on a personnel complaint six months earlier, and the other one is uh, now living in Buffalo. So uh, for the congressman to actually bring that up knowing, knowing I was cleared 
and by three disgruntled employees is disgraceful. This is the type of politics that goes on down in Washington, D.C. He tries to paint a picture of bipartisanship, but you can see as this debate goes on a little further, the real Sean Patrick Maloney is coming out. Well, I think it's important to take the allegations of three high-ranking state troopers seriously, and I'll take their word for it. How about that? And I think the outcome of that litigation is very, is very much different than the way Mr. O'Donnell's portraying. But I make the point because the fact is, is that in a situation where you have uh, a dispute like this, the important thing is the interest of the country. And I think the president could have done much better, much better than to nominate someone who was so divisive in the end and, uh, and it's just going to contribute to ripping us apart. The so fact is, is that we could have done much better. So let's make it clear. He still goes back to this lawsuit, all right? It was dismissed. Dismissed. Three disgruntled employees didn't like that they were supervised. It was dismissed. The fact that he brings it up a second time is unbelievable. Well, you know, it, it's a perfect segue. We've got a few minutes here before we get closing statements. Um, maybe like a lot of you, uh, you know, a dollar and a dream or two bucks, you buy a lottery ticket. Let's say you win the lottery night. I, I, I mean this. You pocket a cool bill. Are you telling me, both of you, with a straight face, you would willingly go to Washington to be an elected official where you were being generous before? You said they had an approval rating 15%. A lot of them have it under 10. You know how toxic an environment Washington is right now. You've got an accomplished career, both of you do. My question is, with all the gridlock, with all the, uh, you know, you think this is nasty, just wait till you get to DC, why? If you had, a, you know, you have options, but if you literally pocketed a billion dollars, so it's a clear example, are you telling me you would still want to go to Washington? Absolutely. So St. Luke tells us, to whom much is given, much is required. I've lived my life giving back to the community. I lived my life donating to different causes, not just time, but uh, financially also. That's what I'm about, giving back. Hey, I work hard. I worked hard as a trooper to go through the ranks, 23 years to lieutenant colonel, one of the top ranks in the state police. I was proud to be picked by Governor Pataki to lead the MTA police, that merger. But it's about your history. It's about what your accomplishments are. I want to continue to work that hard. I want to continue to make a difference for this country in the United States. We need someone with a history of accomplishment. We need someone who just doesn't hand out your tax money and take credit for it. We need someone who will get some money back to New York. We'll need somebody who would not have let the Tappan Zee Bridge be built without rail. That means a lot to the families in Orange County. That means five hours a week less commute that they can spend with their kids had that uh, bridge been built with rail. My opponent sits on a transportation committee. How he let that uh, bridge get built without rail is a disgrace. I'll let your opponent speak to the same question I raised and the issue you did in a second. But if you're elected, you're going to be going to a Congress that for every dollar New York sends there, we get back less than 60 cents, okay? And you look at the tunnel project right now. It's not him who's opposed to coming and bringing the money back. It's the administration and it's other people of your own party. You've already taken stands tonight where you've objected to the president. You would be entering an environment where you'd be fighting both your own party often and the opposition party. And I got, again, I come back to, and I respect it, you know, from whom much is given, much is ex expected. But is, that, is this something you eagerly look forward to do or you do it because you feel it's out of duty? It, it's a response to duty, but I eagerly want to go down there and fulfill that duty. Fair uh, enough. Fair enough. Uh, and I ask you the same question, and, and I, I'll give you credit. Usually you don't give me the, the patent answer. I just want to. But it is, you know this, after six years, you talked about it. It was part of the reason why you looked at, at not having to deal with that dysfunction where you're looking at AG. Why do you really want to do this when you can do other things and there's so much gridlock and nonsense that comes out every day out of Washington and you have to answer some crazy statements that are made, the divisiveness, I've never seen it like this before. I genuinely mean, 
If you could do many other things and you could, why do this? Well, look, you know, I think when you talk to a guy like Ed Kakis, who's in his house tonight in Sparrowbush, New York, because my office got involved and got his disability claim heard. Ed was falling behind in the payments. He lost his wife to a serious illness, and he couldn't afford to stay in his house. Uh, you know, that makes you feel good at the end of the day. There's 6,000 of you who've come to me for help, and we've helped you every time. $18 million returned to those folks. You want to talk about misusing taxpayer dollars? When my opponent ran for county legislature, he said he wouldn't take a salary. But we know now from his financial disclosure form that he took $30,000. He lied about uh, not taking a salary. And he took $30,000 of taxpayer money. We could start by returning some of that. The fact of the matter is he was cited when he ran the in Industrial Development Authority in Orange County for misusing uh, those funds. Uh, when they're supposed to be used for job creation, he used it for a charitable organization. I know that organization. I'm there a lot, too. It's a good organization. But the state budget authority's office said you were misusing taxpayer dollars and taking credit for it. Exactly the thing you come in here and say we shouldn't do. So it's, it's, it's actions like that, lying about taking a salary, lying about the mis, uh, misuse of public funds, that is why people are cynical. But I'm not some shrinking violet. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not naive, and I understand how difficult it is. I have been down there fighting every day. But I have worked across the aisle to get 31 bills passed into law, making your train safer, getting us real crop insurance for our farmers, keeping barges off the Hudson River, making sure you have clean water in your communities, getting PCBs out of the Hudson River, protecting Social Security and Medicare that Jimmy and his crowd keep coming after, trying to get your health care costs lower, negotiating the price of prescription drugs, fighting for that. That is what is going to help all of you. I'm committed to this work, and I'll keep fighting. I know it's negative, but it's worth the fighting for, and I'm going to keep it if you give me, I'm going to keep at it if you give me a chance to go back to Washington. And I'm going to do those no, closing you, statements. You call me no, a liar. we got closing statements, so we're well, going to wrap the show up. Said but use your opportunity when you do your close. Well, I'll let you go right now. We'll flip the order so you can respond to what he no, said, but also use your closing statement. That's not going to be my closing. I'll go last on a okay, closing statement. Enough. But Congress I did your, donate my salary, and I'll prove it. Congressman. Well, look, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the issues tonight. Yeah, we have some disagreements, but the fact of the matter is, is we have to work across the aisle to get things done for all of you. Uh, you can look at my record over six years in the Congress. Uh, it has been the honor of my life to serve you, and I am proud of that record. 31 bipartisan bills passed into law. That's a lot, that's a lot to get done uh, in a dysfunctional Congress, believe me. 6,000 individuals helped in my office, 1,700 veterans and military families. Uh, working every day to fight the opioid epidemic, supporting our cops and our firefighters, our first responders, fighting for clean drinking water and to clean up the Hudson River, get the PCBs out of it once and for all. That's where I'm focused. And that proposal to put 43 new anchorages on the Hudson River, oil barges, that would have been an archipelago of storage facilities all the way from Yonkers to Kingston, well, you're looking at the guy who killed it. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can talk to Admiral Steve Poland, who runs the first department at the Coast Guard. He'll tell you what happened with that. And a lot of you got involved in that fight. And that's the kind of results that I've been getting for you in Washington, despite the gridlock, despite the partisanship. If you give me your voice and your vote on November 6th, I'm going to go back there and fight every day, working with the president when he's right and standing up to him when he's wrong. That's what I've done every day I've been in Congress. I'm asking for your vote, and thank you. Mr. O'Donnell. Certainly. So I'll release my taxes for last year, and you'll see uh, uh, how much money I donated to the different charities. I'll call on uh, the congressman to release his taxes from last year and see how much money he's donated. So to say it's a lie, We've already done. just be... Um, my, my taxes are already I, out there, I, Jimmy. I'm, I'm welcome to. I have not interrupted you one second. <laughs> right. Not one second. Well, I've Con released my tax returns. Not one and, second. And please, please continue, continue with the statement. Yep. Well, if you tell uh, yep. my opponent to please have some courtesy. He likes talking over people. He likes yelling at the uh, secretary of... Uh, um, transportation about the tunnel, screaming at her. His temperament is not that good. But I'll release my taxes. You'll see that I donated my salary last year. Even though he foiled it, it wasn't part of a, a foil request. It was personal donations. So that, let me talk about what I can do and what I can make a difference to. First, I have the temperament to work across the aisle. I don't lose my cool or call people liars without facts. I'm a fact checker. I read everything. I will do what is right for the com community here. I will do what is right when I get to Washington, D.C. You won't have to worry about me calling anybody a liar. You won't have to worry about me calling uh, Trump supporters assholes. That's what he did. 
All right, that type of language doesn't help anyone. It certainly doesn't put out that you're a bipartisan, I'm a great guy to work across the aisle, I'm the best thing since ice cream. Well, you're not. You haven't worked across the aisle on everything. You haven't delivered for the community. You wanted to be the attorney general. This was your second choice. Attorney general, you came in third, and hopefully you come in second in this race. I'm Jimmy O'Donnell. I approve this message, and I'm asking for your vote on November 6th. I will represent all of you. And with that, uh, that will do it tonight. A very uh, entertaining, hopefully informative hour. I'd like to thank both the candidates, Mr. Maloney and Mr. O'Donnell, for joining us tonight. I think we can agree on one thing at least, get out on a vote on Election Day. Thank you for joining us. And our campaign 2018 coverage continues in just a couple of minutes from Maryland's 6th Congressional District for a debate between Democrat David Trump.